your safety, your individual performer safety is the most important thing. Always. Nothing is more important than that. So if you're ever in a situation where a service or someone is asking you for an unnecessary document or you become even remotely concerned about, you know, the safety of that product, you need to stop right there. That should be your giant red sign. Welcome back to On The Horizon. This is Melrose Michaels. I am your host, and I'm here to share what's worked for me in building my adult creator business to try to make building yours just a little bit easier. Let's get into today's episode. Who misses free and affordable ads without the anti-sex work rhetoric? Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists from Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising to the sex work community. They also give back to organizations based in harm reduction, sex work, and education, stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms. Their platform, Trist.link, is a refreshing and well-needed change in both presentation and mission. It's free to join and open to all. In the words of an A4 user, from the policies to the language to the advice and tips, it makes such a big difference to feel supported and encouraged instead of policed. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us. I really do appreciate everyone joining us today because this is not only just like a massively important topic, but it's also one that I really think lacks clarity, especially for independent content creators who, let's say, haven't filmed on a professional porn set or worked in, you know, in close contact with a studio before, which I am one of those such creators myself as well. So today, we have guest Corey Silverstein joining us, who is one of, if not the most active legal expert in the adult industry, also represents most of the platforms that we're all on actively, as well as creators themselves, which is really unique. Corey has over 19 years of experience in the adult industry representation and is president of Silverstein Legal. You can visit his website, of course, at myadultattorney.com, as well as his legal subscription service for creators, which is adult.law. And that specifically provides legal information to independent content creators like you and me. So he is viewed as the premier attorney in the space and has been featured in countless press all over the world. And also full disclosure, he represents small fish like myself. So everyone, please welcome Corey Silverstein. Thanks to all of your followers and everyone who's interested in being here today. I really, uh, I'm really honored that all of you would take the time out of your day to listen what, uh, what Melrose and I have to say. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Corey. Um, okay, so let's start with, I guess let's just start with the overarching, you know, umbrella conversation, which is what are the current laws around like pornography in terms of distribution and then ultimately kind of where the 2257 comes into play? Well, I mean, you talk about pornography right away. It's yuck. No way. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's, that's that's a f phenomenal question. And I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a very deep question because you know when you you mentioned content collaborations it, it's really incredible mel because if you if you look back to when i started in the industry which was what 19 years ago something like that now you know there was no there were no websites like only fans and loyal fans and those sorts of sites that allowed performers to really take full control of their own destiny back when i started in the industry you know porn conve porn uh, creation was very frankly standard you had a director producer and they would hire the talent and the talent would come to the set the content would be produced and that would be the end of it but now yeah. we have this incredible world where content creators are, are truly um I mean, I, you know steal this from seinfeld but they're, they're masters of their own domain they, they're the kings of their own castle and you know that's presented incredible opportunity but it also has presented a lot of challenges because um for those performers that and content creators that used to, you know, create content in the more conventional way, they left it up to the the, the companies they were working for to take care of all the legal compliance, the paperwork, and all that fine jazz. But now it's a different world. And now that all of these content creators are in business for themselves, which is awesome, they have to concern themselves with the business and legal end. And so when you talk about content collaboration, you brought up, of course, one content collaboration means that you're creating content with someone else 
So you get into issues like, well, who owns the content and who has the right to publish it? And what rights do I need from the person that I'm collaborating with? Then, of course, you mentioned 2257, which is the federal law pertaining to age verification. Uh, the law exists so uh, that you, uh, someone creating and publishing adult content has the necessary records to prove that each performer has attained the age of 18 years of age or older. Yeah, yeah. I think what I want to almost back up. So the first thing you mentioned that also I want to discuss is who does own the content. If you're going into a collab, who actually owns the content? Greatest question ever. And it's funny because, you know, I was just uh, at a trade show in Miami and this question gets answered, it gets asked over and over and over again. And the first thing that you have to do is make sure that you and your partner or partners, depending on if you're dealing with multiple people, have the discussion about, okay, who's going to own the work? From a copyright standpoint, it's going to come down to, well, who's actually holding the camera? Who's actually creating the content? And that person de facto is going to be your copyright holder. So it's going to come down to your paperwork in terms of who it is that gets to utilize the content, where they can use it what sort of rules are going to apply. So one of the things that I always tell content performer, excuse me, content creators, and I apologize in advance. Yeah, I, I use the term performer, content creator, social media influencer. I use them all interchangeably. So forgive me if, if any of you fall into a different category that I'm just not hip to yet. So <laughs> that, that, that's on me. <laughs> but um, ultimately, the discussion that you're going to have with your co-collaborators is so important now. I mean, you've got to have that conversation because ultimately from a legal perspective, a lawyer who knows what they're doing in this industry will know how to give people the appropriate rights and documentation. But ultimately, in, you know, putting it in plain English, we need to know from the collaborators themselves, okay, what's your intent? What is it you guys want? So that's the, you know, the real place to start. If you're enjoying this podcast episode so far, please take one moment to share it with another one of your adult content creator friends, because you know what the rule is here. We do not gatekeep, and we want to make as many adult creators' businesses as easy as possible. And you sharing this episode with them might do exactly that. Thanks so much in advance. Aside from like, and, and I've heard this before in terms of like ownership over content, what you mentioned about like who's holding the camera. Um, and that was advice I had been given on the social media, like influencer, you know, brand deal kind of side of things too. It was, um, I consulted with someone around, you know, YouTube content and their take on that was like, whoever's pressing record and holding the camera owns that content, that copyright, unless there's paperwork to dictate otherwise. So it's to the same thing you said in terms of like, okay, you guys want maybe everyone to own the content who's collaborating in it, which is typically what creators think is happening unbeknownst to them. It's not, but if you want each collaborator to have ownership over that content, what does that look like from the legal side in terms of people? Well, from a legal side, I actually, when you start getting into copyright co-authorship, you start getting into actually some pretty complicated issues that oftentimes can create more problems in the future. So typically what, what I suggest is that I guess let's just use an example of of a two uh, performer collaboration because you know we can start with that before we start adding you know three four seventy four depending on you know what you're into, but yeah. exactly oh well, hey whatever he's their own. <laughs> so ultimately, what it's really going to come down to, and, and the way I typically do it for my clients is one person will ultimately be the the owner, but then the other collaborator will be provided with a full unrestricted, irrevocable license. So what that means is that for all intents and purposes, the other performer who is part of that collaboration can do whatever they want with the content. They can monetize it. They can post it up on their own site, on their fan sites, on tube sites, whatever they want, whatever they, they can think of. And so in essence, while yes, from a legal perspective, you have one party that is the, you know, quote unquote, owner of the content, you still are giving all of the rights to your collaborator that you want to give. And the other benefit to this, and this again goes back to what I talked about, where it's so important that people in collaborations talk about what they want. Maybe there's some limitations that you want to put in there. You know, maybe you don't want uh, the content ending up on a uh, on a tube site or you don't want the content ending up um, in front of a paywall. You know, th there's so many different things you can do when it comes to paperwork. And when it comes to limitations of use, that again, it's so important that 
the collaborators are on the same page um, before they make the content. Uh, I've I've often seen content collaborators, they think they're on the same page, then they create the content, and then all of a sudden, they're not on the same page, and someone gets angry, and someone gets mad, and then it turns into a big giant mess. So to avoid all that, it's better that you have everybody on the same page before the content is actually created. Yeah, I can see that. And I've actually, I've been in that situation myself, too, uh, in my earlier, you know, beginning decade time of the industry. I think, so... What I'm hearing too, because this is not what happens, like at least, you know, I feel like I'm a, a professional creator, adult creator, performer, what, whatever you want to call it. But I definitely try to do things, you know, by the book, the right way, the first time, like I try to get it right. But I have rarely been in a situation where who owns the content is discussed or there's some sort of co-authorship or co-licensing agreement that is being signed before content is being created. Um, I would say that rarely, if ever happens, especially between independent content creators. So when we're talking about like this, you know, someone owns the content, that's probably the person hitting record, but then you have this co-authorship or co-licensing agreement. Is that something that is like a standard form creators can pull off of somewhere and use? Is that something that needs to be written up specifically by a lawyer? And if so, does that mean that every time you go to collab, you need to see a lawyer? Well, there's, Man, you're you're very good at asking like seven questions in one. That you, that, Sorry, no, I think no, it's lower. No, writing it, them down. It, it, it's actually it's it's good. So it's just like I'm just trying to not like you know have you break my my uh, my sensitive brain here. Um, no, it's just you, Corey. I know you're expensive, and I'm just gonna milk this for all. Right? <laughs> I am more than I am more than happy with your audience. I am more than happy to do this all day long. The the, the short answer to your question, and I'm gonna kind of do it in different parts. Number one. Do you have to have a lawyer every single time? No. The answer to that question is no. If you have the correct set of documents the first time, then at that point, you can use those documents going forward so long as there's no changes in the law or so long as you're not varying too differently in what the content rights are going to be. The way I typically do my agreements is I set them up so that ultimately a client doesn't have to come to me over and over and over again. Now, that sounds a little crazy and a little counterproductive for a lawyer, but it's the way I practice law. I, I have no interest in, you know, creating agreements or creating documents so that my clients are forced to come back to me and spend more money. I don't do it like that. I want performers in this industry to be using the correct agreements, and I want them to have the ability to be able to do it right over and over and over again without having to to break the bank, so to speak. But going back to your original question, you know, yes, there's correct documents, but there are so many bad documents that are floating around. I mean, I have seen some junk, Mel. I mean, I have seen some of the worst agreements. I, quite frankly, I can't believe that, like, I would think that people had to try to work so hard to create such bad documents. I've seen so many bad forms. And then I see people take these forms and, and trade them and give them to their other collaborators and share them. And they're horrible. And, and this is where the problem, you know, really starts getting worse. So what I do is when a collaborator comes to me, I take the time to understand, okay, tell me about your business. You need to have your lawyer understand what you're doing. If, you're, if you don't have a lawyer out there that's as a first step figuring out what you're doing, then what the hell are you paying for? So, you know, I want to know from the, from the performer, okay, tell me about how you're creating your content. Where are you creating it? What methodology are you doing it? And then from there, we build out a document that works for that performer. And, you know, I get it all the time that people are like, well, you know, it's, I, I can't afford to, you know, to spend X amount of dollars because for whatever reason, or I just don't want to. And what ends up happening is a year later when they're at a, in a war with their collaborator and then, you know, they're getting sued or they have to sue. And now you got to spend, you know, 15, 20,000 plus to deal with, you know, a dispute in court or arbitration, what have you. You know, I don't like saying I told you so, but I say, hey, listen, the number to have these documents done right the first time around is going to be considerably smaller. Now, that doesn't mean, though. That if a content collaborator has something special that they're doing, that they can't go back to their lawyer and say, well, hey, I'm doing something, you know, really unique that's never been done before. And there's going to be some specific limitations, uh, such as, you know, the content will never be displayed showing anyone. Again, I'm throwing out, you know, random examples why that popped into my head. I have no idea. So for those of you that are just picturing, you know, 
people doing things without heads. It's just a little weird. But <laughs> the point is, is that it is possible that someone would want something like that. And so we would want to have an agreement tailored so that, you know, we would ensure that even though someone might have raw footage, that it doesn't become a problem. The other big issue, Mel, is the relationship conundrum. That's that, that's what I've called it. And, you know, there's an expression that I that I that I started using a long time ago. And some people say they're like, oh, Corey, you're so negative. You, you know, you're not loving whatever. I'm like, OK, I'm in that heart romantic like the next guy. But the fact is that all relationships end badly or else they wouldn't end. Come on, people, you know, I'm right. And so the fact is, is that, you know, if you're doing a content collaboration on a Monday with someone that you're madly in love with, you're in a committed relationship, it's your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, your partner, whatever. I got news for you. By Wednesday, there's some reason why maybe you guys aren't in that happy hunky-dory relationship anymore. And now all of a sudden, the excuse that, well, we were in love, so we didn't have paperwork is gone, out the window. And I hear this all the time. Guys, girls, people, I don't care if you are, if you're collaborator that you're creating content with is your wife or your husband or your partner of 45 years. I don't care. The fact is, is that again, you never know when a relationship is going to go bad and it is your paperwork that is going to save you so much legal hassle, heartache. Um, and I deal with it all the time, Mel, whether it's through couples getting divorced, whether it's through somebody uh, infidelity, whether it's just because two people get sick of each other. I mean, God, who's ever heard of that concept, right? Two people getting sick of each other. Yeah. I think this is a really important kind of almost segue to you because, so let me back up before I move on, because I do want to touch on that collaborator aspect of partnerships too. But what it, what is the formal name of an agreement like this? Would, would it be like a co-licensing agreement on top of like whoever owns the copyright? It, it depends. I mean, it, it depends. Sometimes it might be a license agreement. Sometimes it might be a, uh, a a simple performer release. Sometimes it might be a collaboration agreement. It really depends on the circumstance. And again, this is where, Mel, so many people are doing it wrong because they try to take one form that's labeled as whatever, and then they try to make the form squeeze into their situation. That's not the way it's supposed to go. You're supposed to okay. build your contract around what it is you're doing. And this yeah. is a, a dangerous epidemic that we've seen. What, uh, one of the funnier examples is I've seen collaborators use my forms because, you know, they, they saw it somewhere else and they decided they were going to use it or, you know, or try to mutilate it. You know, they try to modify it. And, and I basically end up calling it like mutilation it's like think of like one of the the worst horror movies you can think of you know like one of the movies where you know someone's like mouth gets like moved to the side and a nose removed and an ear removed mm -hmm. that's what people have done to my agreements and and you know they, they're like oh you know this is great we have this agreement i'm like no it's totally wrong it's been gutted it's it's it doesn't even cover what you guys are doing and it's it's I want to touch on that too because I want to know is if, if because okay so it sounds like a co-licensing form or a photo release it has to be specific to the case or like to what you are about to do in terms of content and like really having your ducks in yep. a row but the second part of that that I did want to ask which I feel like you're going into conveniently is um if someone takes a form like one of your forms offline and edits it to try to fit their circumstance of what they're going to shoot or what they're going into um in terms of collaboration is that even enforceable? Anymore? Well, that's that's a whole other question, because a lot of times when you take these forms, the you know, content collaborators and excuse me, content creators. I mean, you have so many people listening right now. They're based all over the all over the United States, all over. Can I recognize some of you as Canadians. I, I see there's even some people who are outside of the U.S. and Canada. The laws regarding intellectual property and performer releases they're not the same in every state and in every jurisdiction. In fact, if you're in California, you've got 20 other problems you have to worry about. And the documents you're going to need when you're in California are actually completely different than the documents in all the other states. And so this is another area where I see people screwing up. They take one of these documents like, oh, perfect. You know, this covers me. And then they send it to me and I say, did you notice that you guys have a provision in here that says that the laws of Taiwan apply and they're like what look at the provision in there this was a form that wasn't built for two people creating content in the state of Florida 
this was a, a document that was created for people that were creating content in Taiwan. So then you have major problem. And that happens every day. I wish I could tell you that it's not an everyday occurrence. You know, I can tell you that by the time I log back into my email after we're done with it, with, with what we're doing right now, I'll probably have five more emails for people describing to me disaster situations because they were using forms they shouldn't have been. See, and this is, so I do want to touch on another aspect of, of this because this is something me and you personally went through when I was, you know, negotiating a contract. And I think a lot of things creators don't realize within like, contracts or agreements or release or that state at which things need to be litigated. And can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, f first things first, I want every person that's here today to realize, and this is always important. And, and for those of you that take away anything from this, remember that until you sign the contract, everything is negotiable. So when someone you know sends you over their agreement to use, don't think for a second that you have to sign it. It's all the terms are negotiable. If you're not in a position where, you know, you feel confident enough that you can negotiate, no problem. Reach out to me and I'll negotiate it for you. If you don't have, you know, for whatever reason, you don't feel comfortable contacting me. My suggestion to you is reach out to some of the other tremendous individuals in this industry. You know, this industry, contrary to, to you know, what mainstream media wants to portray the adult entertainment community as, is filled with some of the most wonderful people in the world. And if you ever take a second to reach out to some of these people, they want to help you. They're not they're not interested in seeing harm come to you. So don't ever be afraid to reach out to other people in the industry and say, you know, hey, I've got a question. Um, there's this provision, and this agreement that just got sent over. Have you ever seen this before? What do you think of this? Ask those questions and always feel that you can negotiate. If you don't like something in an agreement, you've got two options. You can negotiate and try to get something that you're con content with. Or two, here's a great one. Don't sign it and don't shoot with that person. There are more than enough people in this world that are willing to create content. Don't ever feel obliged if someone tries to push you or uh, try to encourage you to agree to terms that you're not comfortable with. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think that's where, that's kind of, again, where me and you had met on what I was working on in terms of like where things had to be litigated. Because when we were negotiating something, the litigation aspect, if if things were to go awry, was actually overseas in another country, which then I would have had to like incur those expenses and travel overseas to fight this if it was to go south. And I think that, it because it, it, it never occurred to me that part of the, the contract that I was signing to even think twice about that. Whereas you were very adamant of like, no, we need to litigate this here. I think um, because we would have a benefit there, one in, in cost, but two of being in that jurisdiction. Well, exactly. And and this is where, you know, you have to look at these provisions. They're they're called they're called uh, venue selection clauses in contracts. And it dictates where, OK, if there's a dispute between the two parties, where is that dispute going to be resolved? So, you know, if, you know, one of you is is located in New York, New York, but someone puts a contract in front of you that says if there's a dispute, you guys are going to uh, resolve that dispute in Italy. Well, I got news for you. It's going to get really expensive really quick because you're going to have to pay the fees associated with litigating a case in Italy. And people miss those provisions all the time. And, you know, again, you want to be in a position where if something does go wrong and you are going to need, you know, to to resolve a conflict. Listen, who, who the hell wants to resolve a conflict in Italy? Now, listen, I'm not saying Italy is not a beautiful place, but I'm just saying that if you live in New York, New York, I don't really think you want to litigate a case in Italy. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Now, Corey, I do want to jump in here and kind of narrow down our focus a little bit on the 2257 documents. I guess to start, let's just talk about what they are for some of maybe like the new creators who are here listening today. So 2257 is, so we're going to, I'm going to give you guys like a, a, a crash 101 quick course. Bottom line is what you have to do with 2257 is that if you're publishing content, you need to have requisite documents to prove that all of the performers in your depiction were 18 years of age or older at the time the content was created. So how do you do that? Really straightforward. All you need is one form of of United States issued government ID. So what that's going to mean, big people, and photo ID, excuse me, that's going to mean a driver's license or a passport, okay? Your 
local um, credit card that may or may not have your picture is not going to suffice. So what you have to do is make sure that you have clear copies of those uh, identification cards so that if the U.S. government ever wants to uh, do a search to ensure that you have records to prove that uh, everyone in your depiction is 18, you've got them. The other thing that you should have and is a basically it's a 2257 records keeping form. And this is a form that will help keep you organized. The document will include such things as the date of production, um, the names of the people in it, the birthdays of the people in it, what IDs were used um, in order to verify that the person was 18 uh, years of age. Oh, another big catch has to be a valid ID. So let's just say uh, for, you know, all of you that are here today, today's May 30th as we're doing this live. If someone presents you with an ID that expired on May 29th, that ID is not valid and you are not in compliance with 2257 record keeping. Huge deal. So making sure that you have um, the the copy of the, the government issued ID and your document so that you have the requisite information is going to be key. And it's not that hard, Mel. And this is one of the things that frustrate me as a lawyer that I think some people have you know, really overcomplicated 2257 outside from the fact that you need to do it because 18 USC 2257 is a federal law that has a criminal penalty with it. That's right. First offense up to five years in federal prison. Outside of that, remember that you guys, the content creators who are, you know, really making the world go round now, let's say down the road, you want to sell your content or you want to sell your library or your website or whatever you want to do. The first thing that someone acquiring your assets is going to be is going to say, okay, send us over a copy of all of your 2257 documents. And if you say you don't have it, you no longer have a sellable asset. No one is going to buy adult entertainment content, whether it's video or imagery, without the necessary 2257 records. Yeah, I think that's so this is like a very macro part of this that I think is really interesting to discuss because you know, all the creators that are, you know, following Sex or CEO and that listen to our stuff are really like the most business savvy adult creators that there are. Like they're the ones trying to constantly improve and build real businesses and approach things uh, like an entrepreneur. So when you talk about big, you know, I guess big ideas like such as selling your library or selling an asset, that is really important because I think a lot of creators are just getting by in their day to day. They're not really looking at the longevity of their business. Like I'm building something I could sell one day. I can actually, you know, like in quote unquote exit what I've done and, and make some money off of it. So I think that's a really good distinction. I do want to double back on the valid ID thing because there's a lot of like lack of clarity around creators who think that if the ID was valid at the time of filming, that that's enough. And that some are confused by if you always have to keep a valid ID on file every year, you know, you're, every time it expires. Can you clarify that? Yeah, and, and this is where things get a little bit tricky, Mel, because th there's a combination of two things. You have the 2257 record keeping requirement, which requires a valid ID at the time of production. So what this means is that if the, in the example I gave you earlier, remember the, the May 29th example, if the ID was invalid on May 29th, come May 30th, you can no longer use that particular ID. So every time that uh, you do a, a you know creation, you need to make sure that the, that the ID is valid. The second issue is that times have changed tremendously in this industry. And Visa and MasterCard ha are putting an immense amount of pressure on content platforms. I cannot tell you how many hours, days, weeks I have spent on the phone with platforms in the last year, getting them caught up with Visa and MasterCard's regulations. The fact is, is that Visa and MasterCard control the industry. People say like, whoa, Corey, why are you saying that? Because the fact is, is that 99% of adult entertainment transactions go through credit cards, which is Visa and MasterCard, which means Visa and MasterCard is not a government. They are, yes, they're publicly traded, but they're a private company. They can make up whatever rules they want. And if they tell the platforms that there's certain things they have to have in their records, including a valid up-to-date ID. So for those of you that, you know, I'm sure recently, maybe you got a request from the platform you're uploading to saying, hey, your ID expired. We need a new one. That's actually not, that's kind of a combination of a 2257 issue and a Visa MasterCard issue kind of falls into two categories. Okay. Okay. So 
Now, I do want to also discuss this other piece that I think a lot of creators aren't aware of because this is something that I did not come into the industry knowing, especially not in the beginning of the time I actually started, you know, venturing off into collab content. But there's actual requirements, not just about having in in, in getting a 2257 and valid ID and all of that, but also how you store your 2257s. So can we talk about that a little yes. bit? 2257 records have to actually, they specifically, they need to be organized in a certain format, meaning that if the government wanted to conduct a inspection and if they were able to uh, um, get a warrant because uh, there was a there was a, a case, uh, there was a lawsuit that the Free Speech Coalition was one of the lead plaintiffs on. And ultimately, in that case, one of the things that came out of it is that warrantless uh, inspections of 2257 records were not permissible. So if someone wants to do an inspection of your 2257 record, they're going to have to go to a federal magistrate or judge and get a warrant first. The issue that a lot of people have is that there's a component in the 2257 record keeping statute that requires your records to be organized in a certain manner, meaning that if the government wants to come in and they want to be able to search a record by the date, or if they want to search a record by, um, the per one of the performers aliases i.e stage name you have to be able to do that so you the you have to be able to very quickly be able to access any record and it has to be organized in the way that the statute tells you to um again this is one of those things that it doesn't have to be the hardest thing in the world it actually can be quite simple it just really comes down to making sure that you're doing it and you're doing it right Thankfully, to date, we've never seen a technical violation of the statute prosecuted, meaning we haven't seen the U.S. government prosecute anyone because they didn't keep their records in a certain order. But that doesn't mean, you know, based on what we're seeing with the U.S. government's very conservative um, approach right now, I, I guess is probably the, the way to put it. That's a nice way of thinking. Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to put it that way because I, I think that's probably the nicest way to say it. Um, you never know when the government's going to try to utilize one of the weapons at its disposal. And this, again, Mel, is another reason why I continue to encourage everyone. And I, I say this again, that it's not that hard. And if you don't know how, no problem. There's no shame in that. You know, when, when you first get into this business, nobody, you know, knows everything right from the start. You reach out to someone like me, reach out to someone else in the industry who knows how to do it right and and learn it. Don't 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 just do it by trial and error, because when it comes to 2257, we're talking about a criminal statute. So error, you know, the consequences aren't going to be very friendly. Yeah, no, 100 percent. When so when we're talking about storing 2257s, is there a discrepancy between having them stored like printed physical in a filing cabinet or a discrepancy between it's okay to have them in a digital format on a cloud or something like that. Well, here's where here's where it also gets complicated. And this is another thing that I, I, I tell my clients to be careful about. Things happen in this world that we can't predict. And they're like, well, what the hell does that mean, Corey? Well, we everyone lives in different places in the world. Some of you live on a coast where, you know, you might be subject to hurricanes or flooding or whatever. And if you're only keeping paper records, and for whatever reason, you get hit with a flood and you lose all your paper records. Guess what? Like we talked about before, your content library is now basically worthless. And let's say you're a digital person and you keep all your records on a Mac store external hard drive. I have no idea whether Mac store external hard drives even exist anymore. I think I, I had one in like 20 years ago. But let's hypothetically say that's the only place you're keeping your records and your um your hard drive fails, which for all of you that are listening today, you guys know that hardware failures are basically, you know, <laughs> an everyday occurrence. So, you know, candidly, having both is probably the safest way to go. And so, in, you know, some people complain like, oh, but I'm going to have to have like a, you know, a box of records somewhere or whatever. And I'm like, and my response to that is I'm like, is that really the worst problem that you're going to have in your life is to have to keep a box somewhere? You have to think of what yeah. the consequences could be of a flood of a I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, I had uh, God, this goes back probably, I don't know, 10 years ago. Man, I feel old now. But about 10 years ago, I had a client who uh, was was in Kansas, state of Kansas. And uh, this particular client had a, a very large uh, production studio where they were licensing content out, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's Kansas. And well, guess what happened? Got hit with a tornado lost all the 2257 records, 
everything was lost. They had no backups. Financial disaster. It took years to clean it up. You know, a lot of you will say, well, what's, you know, what's the chances of a tornado falling on my house? What's the chances of a, of a hard drive failing? What's the chances of, you know, of the U.S. government getting hot to trot on 2257 again? I don't know. I, you know, my crystal, go my crystal ball broke a long time ago and I haven't been able to get it repaired. But what I can tell all of you is that you can do simple things to protect yourself. Why not do it? It's not that, not yeah. that hard. No, absolutely. And the other part of that is like, if you really are approaching your business like a business, you should really be aware of like where things are vulnerable and what like threats there are potentially to what you're building. So I think just knowing that and taking on that responsibility of like, okay, this is my business. I'm taking it seriously. These are the things that could jeopardize my business. Let's safeguard them. I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, I want to also ask like, what are the legal is there a statute or like a time for how long you need to keep records or how long dating back or, you know, anything like that? Or is it forever? It's, it's, it depends on if, if the content is still up, then it in essence is forever. But if the content comes down, then you have to hold them for a certain period of time and then you can dispose of them. But for that, what I always tell clients is for that particular issue about when you can destroy 2257 records is to always talk to legal counsel ahead of time. Because even though the statute might say you're clear to dispose of, of the records because your content has been down for X period of time, that doesn't mean you're still not going to want to hang on to them for potentially civil liability protection. So that's one of those categories where you should talk to, because right? remember that you're dealing with very sensitive records. And another thing, and I'll, I'll tell you, this is an interesting one, Mel, because this actually just happened this morning. You talked about forms there earlier and 2257 record keeping. I was presented earlier today uh, with a, a potential client that reached out to my office and they gave me one of these forms that's being kicked around right now. And this particular form, when I'm looking at it, I'm like, what the hell? It's asking for social security numbers in, on a 2257 form. Where in the hell does it say in, a, in, the, in the statute anywhere that you're supposed to be collecting a social security number? In fact, it clearly says that you're not supposed to collect unnecessary information. And on top of that, you're putting yourself and you're putting the performer at risk for having their social security uh, number exposed in the event of a data breach. You know, this, what you just said just reminded me that, again, it's like, you know, some of these these so-called forms out there, you know, not only are they not going to protect you, some of them can actually put you in harm's way. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, so this it, that's an interesting segue, too, because we're talking about privacy breaches and things of that nature. So. I do want to ask because something I've used in the past, um, and this is created by you know really reputable people. This is the um, from Larry Wallace and them, but um, the Quick Two Two Five Seven app. So that's an app that I've used, mm -hmm. and it essentially leaves you room to kind of like fill out the form, the two two five seven, a type of photo release, all of that, and then I'll email it to yourself and the other performer. Is there any risk to facilitating two two five seven in that way? Is there I guess I'll start with in that way. Is is that a safe way to go about 2257? Let's do it. Quick 2257 was an app that was developed by my co my colleague Larry Walters. Um, I, I believe he charges a whopping 99 cents for the app. It's very easy to use. Yes, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly safe. And that is more than an acceptable way. Because in that particular instance, the, the records are being uh, taken in per the regulations, per, uh, you know, that were obviously reviewed and studied by uh, my colleague Larry. And so, yes, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, I've also seen some people do some crazy stuff with 2257 records. That's just totally inappropriate where they, oh my God, from, from a privacy standpoint, I've seen the, some of the dumbest things, Mel. I saw one company accidentally send, they were trying to send one to specific 2257 record. And unfortunately, the way their database worked, the, they checked the wrong box and they ended up sending all of the 2257 records for every performer to this individual. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of security concerns that can happen. But when it comes to that, you know, there's there is a responsibility that I believe every company, every person in the adult entertainment industry has. The fact is, is that performers are, quite frankly, heavily targeted. Uh, look, the gross majority of people that are buying your content, watching your entertainment are good people. They want, they're watching you for the entertainment value. They're watching you because, you know, they want to pay for it. But unfortunately, there are bad people in this world. And these people are looking for every 
you know, inch to try to hurt you, to try to expose you, to try to meet you or, you know, whatever, you know, there is going on upstairs in their heads. And you have to be savvy that those people are out there and you have to be cognizant of the fact that those people might be out there wanting to hurt you. So you always, above all else, and I I tell every performer this, your, your safety, your individual performer safety is the most important thing. Always. Nothing is more important than that. So if you're ever in a situation where a service or someone is asking you for an unnecessary document or you become even remotely concerned about, you know, the safety of that product, you need to stop right there. That should be your giant red sign. You know, don't don't yeah. just sign up for products and services that you find online because someone's offering you a 90-10 payout. Go yeah. ask people in the industry, have you have you ever used that product? Do you know who's behind that product? Because I'm going to tell you right now, as you know, I've represented, I can't even tell you how many performers over the years that have been doxxed, uh, stalked, you name it. And, you know, oftentimes it comes from the performer giving information to someone that they quite candidly trusted or thought that they can trust. And so that goes back to one of my original uh, recommendations that don't be afraid to lean on other people in in the industry. And I'm telling you that if you reach out to them, they're not going to tell you, go away. I don't have the time for you. They don't want to see bad or harm come your way. They want to help you. And they will tell you if if someone that you're about to do business with, they've never heard of, or if they have a reputation for being bad, or there's a, a history of, of uh, data privacy violations or exposure. This is, this is key here. You know, th- this is huge. And, and, and again, I, you know, I've spent my career trying to protect this industry. And I can tell you that again, yes, the majority of people, you know, they, they're here for entertainment purposes, but the fact is, is that there are bad people in this world and it is very tough to spot them. Sometimes you got to be on the lookout for them and you've got to talk with each other because if, if the community doesn't talk with each other to let it be known who, you know, a bad customer might be, or a known bad customer or a known, you know, new scammer platform or what have you, then, you know, then you guys aren't doing yourselves any favors. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I mean, that really is where like sex work CEO came to stem from is making sure we have a community resource that is trusted and can be relied upon and can share information like that. Like what we're doing literally right now, I think that you've hit on it perfectly. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, consent checklists um, in the industry. So I think consent checklists are really useful. I find them really important. But I don't necessarily know in terms of legality if they do or don't do anything outside of like outlining what you guys are going to do. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, checklists are good and they're bad. Checklists are good because there's certain items when you're creating content that are absolute necessity you want to make sure you have. So if you have a checklist of things that you absolutely need, such as your performer release, 2257 record keeping form, uh, location release, you know, certain things that are absolutely necessary, they're great. Um... But here's the problem. Sometimes when you have a checklist, you start living by that checklist. And like, well, Corey, what the hell does that mean? Well, a checklist doesn't excuse not using the most powerful muscle in your bodies, which is your brain. And oftentimes you'll be in a situation where the situation itself might dictate you might require some extra measures, uh, depending on the level of sexual content, or excuse me, sexual contact, STD, SDT, ugh. STD testing. That's a tongue twister. I apologize. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is a, you know, a, 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 uh, or, or infectious, excuse me, and in, STD is not really proper to say anymore. I think it's infectious. FDI. Yeah. Yeah. F- forgive, forgive me guys. Again, I'm 19 years in the industry to, you know, these acronyms and everything. I get confused once in a while. But so STI testing is something sometimes that might be necessary depending on what level of, of sexual uh-huh. contact is occurring. Um, depending on the type of scene you're doing, um, I have a a conversation with a lot of my, my FinDom customers out there. Uh, FinDom is one of those areas where, um, a lot of money in that right now, a lot of popularity in that right now, but a lot of pitfalls. And if you start relying too heavily on checklists, you might actually do something that's going to get you into trouble. So, and, and I'm starting to see some pretty extreme stuff with this FinDom, uh, uh, stuff and, and, you know, I could see checklists getting you into trouble there a little bit. 
I think that's a, a good place too, because that, so in terms of like a consent checklist, like say you're in a BDSM kind of situation or a DOM situation, like in you have gone through this consent checklist said like, yes, I consent to this during our scene. No, I don't consent to this. Do those consent checklists come into play, legally speaking, if something should go awry? They do. They absolutely do. But there's something better than a consent checklist. Act. Everyone who's listening right now is like, what? What the hell is he talking about? It's actually consent video. So one thing that I always recommend to my clients, and this is something that, that most of my clients do, is in addition to having your your film material or your, your you know, whatever technology you're using to record your content, whether it's your your phone or your is saying camcorder appropriate or is that like is that like is, is that no is that also you can keep aging yourself but that's funny right. yeah camcorder. Right, so if you're still using a camcorder or you're still i was gonna say vhs camcorder but even that i know I, okay that was a joke but you know you should have a second camera system going that one records the entire interaction between you and everyone you're shooting with well why because the camera speaks volume and if if you know shit goes downhill and down the road you know you're in court and someone is saying something is consensual and something wasn't you've got the film that's recording the entire interaction between you and your co-performers that will show exactly what happened and part of that is i always request that excuse me i always suggest that you do both on camera pre-shoot interviews and post-shoot interviews and I, you know, what I do for my clients is I actually give them a list of questions that I want them to ask performers on camera, both before and after the scene. Questions like, hey, what's your name? Why are you here today? How did you get here today? Um, what exactly are we going to be doing today? Are there any uh, are there any sexual activities that you're not comfortable with that that we've discussed and are not going to happen today? What specific sexual acts are going to occur today? I'm just giving you examples. There's there's other there's other things that I want, but these interviews, oh my god. Like I, I can't tell you how many people they've saved in this industry. And I also can't tell you how many people they've broken in this industry because look, a, as you guys all know, when a relationship goes bad, shit can really go bad. Yeah. So you want to have this video so that when one party starts contesting and saying, "Well, no, that wasn't discussed. We were never supposed to do that." Then you've got the video. Same thing for post interview for post production interview. This is where, hey, um, did did you have a good time today? Were you comfortable? Did everything that we that we do did it did it meet your you know did we fall within your guidelines? Did we you know did we do anything you didn't like? Uh, you know would you come back and shoot again, etc. And now you have all these specific issues on video, not just in writing. So. My recommendation, again, is kind of a twofold approach where one, you're recording the entire interaction between the parties and two, you're recording these essential questions, which in many cases are checklist questions like you called them out both before and after the shoot. OK, that is so incredibly helpful to so many people I'm sure listening right now, because especially if you've never been on a mainstream porn set and I have also never been. Like those kind of pre-interviews, post-interviews, or having a camera off the, to the side rolling, capturing the entirety of the shoot start to finish. Like that's not something I've thought about. Like that's not something I've put in practice. So that alone is such a valuable piece of information that you shared today. Um, I do want to kind of get into some of the questions that people submitted sure. um, for the space specifically. So the first one is what can someone do if they were tricked in making content? And the context for this is that uh, they were tricked into a content trade. Well, I guess not a trade, but they were supposed to be paid $1,000 and then the other performer rescinded it. Um, and now they are extorting this performer B, I guess, with the fact that they have content over them. What legal action should this person take? Well, this is where things get interesting because as part of any contract, you have to have what's called consideration consideration means something needs to be exchanged in exchange for one party giving something someone else. So in the example you just gave, let's say that someone shot the content but then refused to pay the performer, there's an argument that the contract between the parties is invalid. Thus, since the contract is invalid for lack of consideration, the name and likeness rights that you need in order to publicize and commercialize someone's content aren't there. So this actually gives the performer that wasn't paid a tremendous amount of uh, ability to potentially uh, nullify a contract, 
there's there's uh, even potential lawsuits for for abuse of someone's name and likeness. There, there's there's a hundred different things you could do. So don't ever um, feel helpless in the case where you weren't paid, because that's you know there's a big argument there that the contract doesn't even enforce. What if that was just a verbal agreement? Well, if you don't have a verbal agreement, if you have a verbal agreement, there's nothing in writing. You have an argument that the person was never given the necessary rights to broadcast your product online anyway. So, again, this is a situation where, you know, for a lot of you that don't have necessary paperwork, that can be a massive issue. Huge issue. Verbal agreements in this particular industry are frankly worthless. Yeah. No, that's amazing uh, advice. I'm sure that's going to help tremendously to this performer who's reached out. Yeah, it, it, um, I, and I feel I feel terrible for that performer. My heart goes out to them because you know you you, you this is a career where you you know you perform the service you're expecting to be paid. That's that's not what's supposed to happen in this industry. And this is another example where that person that didn't pay you to whoever that you know performer is. This is someone that you know you should make sure that other people in the in the community know. So that they don't go and shoot with him or her and make the same mistake. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I want to ask as well, um, what are the legalities that says uh, when it comes to rev sharing on collab, collab content? If any? There's no rules. It, it, it's actually you can do whatever you want. That's the nice thing about it. When it comes to contracts, like I was saying earlier, you can do whatever you want. So if the parties, you know, agree to a 50 50, you know, rev share, you can do that. If the parties agree to. 100 100 rev share they can agree to that now now some of you are saying well, what the hell is 100 100 rev share that's where both parties are able to monetize the content in any way they want and they both are able to keep 100 percent of what they collect so if they both have only fans pages they both get you know they don't have to share any of their portion with the other uh with the other performer um uh, in the collab but you know oftentimes i've seen everything i've seen 50 50 i've seen 60 40 um, it depends also sometimes one party might get more, more, a bigger fee because, uh, they did more work such as content editing, um, big thing that, you know, again, the people, you know, content creators, I know you guys can appreciate this, but there's a lot of people out there that don't appreciate just how difficult and time consuming content editing can be. So, you know, if, if one side is doing all the content editing, you know, maybe they'll get, maybe it'll be a 60-40 split or a 70-30 split. I've, I've seen all sorts of... Okay, I, I, I did see an, I saw an unconscionable one this morning that I thought was ridiculous. I did see someone propose a 90-10 a ninety ten split, and I actually, uh, I said, I told my client not to do that, run away from that person. That sounds super predatory. Just a tad. I mean, I think 90-10 is a little, a little bit on the unfair side. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one because we did kind of touch on the you know, Dom, BDSM side of things. Um, what do you want to make sure of if you're creating content with a submissive? And I'm in, the, in this case, I'm assuming the submissive is is in the content, obviously, but they're not being compensated for the content because that's their role as a submissive is kind of the take. But what does that mean in terms of publishing the content, even though there's no exchange of what you had mentioned consideration? That's where you've got to be careful in your writing. And you're going to need a contract that makes it clear that the consideration is the actual person doing the scene for um, whatever value it's going to be. You're going to need some very specific language in there. And that's a tricky one because I've seen it go both ways. I've seen that that type of consideration be held as insufficient. And I've seen some instances where it has been held as sufficient. So that's a tricky one. That's one that you don't want to, you know, that's not one you could just rip a, fo a form off the wall. So if you're doing that sort of work, you are going to need some legal advice. And you're also going to have to look at where the content is being created too. Because again, that particular issue could be highly problematic if you're creating that content in say Mississippi or Alabama or Utah or Louisiana, or maybe one of the other states that recently passed uh, unconstitutional state age verification laws, you know, you never know what you know what sort of crazy rulings you can get out of out of places like that. So you you've got a, some serious questions you have to look into there, and there's there's not going to be one answer. Okay, that's amazing. No, that's helpful in and of itself because that that consideration piece is really interesting. Um, this one, how do you or do you have any? Because this might fall outside of the legality stuff more for like CPA, and I don't want to cross contaminate that. But are there any legal tips in terms of starting an LLC? People should know. I love LLCs. I, I love them for for solo creators. I think they're fantastic. But 
what I'm going to tell you creators is that be very careful about where you're creating your LLCs. Because in some states, the wall between what information you provide the state and the creeper out there is too thin. And so there are certain states, some people think that if you form an LLC, you have to do it in your home state. That's completely incorrect. You can form LLCs in virtually any jurisdiction that you want in the, in the U.S. And there are some jurisdictions that are much more favorable to privacy. And so you need to be having conversations about where you should be forming that LLC. There are some states that are and jurisdictions that are much more friendly. And in fact, there are some states where <clears throat> cough, cough, hint, hint, California, where, you know, historically everyone think we're so wonderful. But in my opinion, California is actually one of the worst places to form your entity. That's really interesting. And when you say California is one of the worst places, why do you say that? Too much data, no privacy wall, and way too expensive. And of course, you have the entire employer versus employee versus independent contractor situation with AB5 that has made life absolutely miserable for uh, content creators. Interesting. Okay. That's that's really, I didn't know all of that. Some people, I, I some some people hate it. They they hate it. I mean, they, I've had like some heated debates. This I have people that, that hate me saying it because, you know, California historically was so open and wonderful to the adult entertainment community. But frankly, I disagree with that proposition right now. I actually think they've become quite unfriendly and and uh, quite unwelcoming to the adult entertainment industry. So when you say to me, you know, what should they people be on the, look in, on the lookout for, they should be on the lookout for creating LLCs in states that are going to be too easy to find out who you really are and creating LLCs in states that frankly are going to turn around and potentially screw you because you're not paying appropriate taxes and such. Yeah, absolutely. There's this last question. Um, well, I guess there's two more, but I'd let me know if you have to hop off as well. Um, something that someone's asking is, in terms of revoking consent, mm -hmm. when do, when can that begin and stop when you're in a, in a scene? You're in a no, it's the second you say no. Nobody can, there, you cannot consent to a sexual assault or a rape. If someone, if you are in a scene and you are uncomfortable at any point, I don't care what the hell is going on. You say stop, the scene stops, plain and simple. If it doesn't, you're now working with a criminal, plain and simple. I love that. I think that is, I love your integrity in that because we don't get that a, a lot out of people we can. I've got, I've got, I've right. got major issues. I've got major issues with that because I've been in this industry a long time and I've seen things and I've heard things. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a performer, and again, I don't care what sort of content you're creating. Really, I, I don't care. I don't care if you guys are just sitting doing a, 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 a foot massage clip. If a performer says, stop, I'm no longer comfortable with this, you stop. It's over. It's done. I don't quite comprehend where people seem to have lost that notion. But again, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're sitting there rubbing a person's hand. If you're rubbing a person's hand and they say, stop, you stop. No is no. I'm uncomfortable. Any of these words. After that, again, you're dealing with a criminal. I love that. That's perfect. Okay. Well, I, that's all the questions I have, Corey. Is there anything else you want to leave people with or also shout out your stuff before I kind of wrap all this up? Yeah. I mean, real quick, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, they can. you guys can reach me on my website, myadultattorney.com. You can uh, reach out to me on Twitter at myadultattorney. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen. I try to be active on Twitter. I'm still not the absolute greatest social media. I will admit it, but I'm, I'm doing my best. So please don't make fun of me when I post something stupid. But actually, I, I, I just wanted to thank you all because, you know, I've been watching what Mel's been doing with Sex Work CEO and, you know, the community that, that she's building. You should all be so proud of yourselves that you guys are, are you know, taking the time to, to be here today and be part of this, you know, this group dialogue because you guys are are the industry. There is no industry without you content creators. So, you know, it's my privilege to be here. And, and frankly, I'm honored that that you guys would e even you know, want to sit and listen to me. I, I, frankly, when I hear my voice, like on a recording later on, I think I have the most annoying voice in the world. So the fact that you guys have been listening to me for the last hour is like mind boggling. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, we've had a lot of phone calls, Corey, and your voice is, it's music to my ears. It, it saves me more money than it costs me over you, time. And that's what I, I remember. You say that, but then the last time we spoke, you told me you were off to your migraine doctor. So obviously something there isn't genuine. Okay, well, on that note, I'm going to mute Corey and uh, I'm going to wrap up. <laughs>
But um, thanks for everyone who did tune in. I do want to mention we have a lot of great courses coming out, um, including courses about new platforms that are coming to market that are going to help automate and generate new subscribers for your fan sites. I'm really excited to announce that. Um, we're also working on some courses around AI solutions for your adult creator businesses. And then other things like how you can utilize free trials and track the money that comes off of those free trials for your platform. So these are things in the works right now. I'm really looking forward to bringing them to you on our YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed, please do. It's youtube.com forward slash SWCEO. I think I said that right. Yeah. And then turn on our notifications so you never miss any of the videos. Um, I do want to also shout out and say a huge thank you to everyone who subscribed to our Telegram bot. We've surpassed over 600 users since launching, and it's really cool to see all of the positive feedback that's come in. Um, if you aren't familiar, we release a Telegram bot that essentially sends you a daily you know, content inspiration so that you know what you could be shooting that day. And then it also includes all of the captions you need for your feed, your PPV locked messages, your clip store descriptions, et cetera. And they're all professionally written uh, with calls to action. The ideas themselves, I research using AI so that we're getting the most desirable kind of storylines based on what fans are out there looking for. And then the captions, again, they're optimized with calls to action so that you actually increase your earning potential and your unlock rate with each caption. The Telegram bot pushes your daily dose of inspiration to your phone around 10 a.m. Central Standard Time every day. So you no longer have to like waste your time doing the researching, the planning or coming up with ideas. The bot just takes care of all of it. So thank you to everyone who's, you know, launched the bot, uses the bot, subscribes to the bot. We really appreciate you because you kind of help make what we're doing here possible. Um, we're also looking upon much request to release a Dom niche version of this bot, as well as maybe a webcam girl or like webcam creator version of the spot to give like, you know, daily live stream ideas. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And then lastly, and most importantly, I do want to emphasize that all of the information on SexWorks Heal we're putting out is, you know, free. It's, it's resources for our community because we want more of our community to be financially successful so that we can do things like lobby Congress, impact policy, organize, and more. So if you found value in the content you heard here today or any of the tweets we've put out, you've engaged with, et cetera, it would be absolutely incredible if you rated this podcast five stars and left a little review we want to get this podcast to as many adult creators as possible and you taking a second to leave a couple stars and a review really helps us do that thanks so much who misses free and affordable ads without the anti-sex work rhetoric Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists from Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising to the sex work community. They also give back to organizations based in harm reduction, sex work, and education. Stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms, their platform, Trist.link, is a refreshing and well-needed change in both presentation and mission. It's free to join and open to all. In the words of an A4 user, from the policies to the language to the advice and tips, it makes such a big difference to feel supported and encouraged instead of policed.